Welcome, and uh, thank you for joining me for this breakout session uh, dedicated entirely to sadness. Um, I don't take for granted that you chose to join me today. It's not very often, at least in my life, that I have the opportunity to gather with others and focus our attention on melancholy and sadness together. Um, not a topic that gets a lot of room and space in uh, current culture today, um, though a theme that you may have heard woven through uh, many of the keynotes and breakout sessions of this particular conference, the theme of tears, of feeling our futility, of feeling sadness. Um, again, it, it's a difficult topic to talk about from the head. It's such a matter of the heart and um, typically left to the realm of artists. Um, I, I, I certainly wish I could have captured my passion for this subject for you in a poem or a song. I almost contemplated simply taking the whole hour to sit together and play, put on some sad melancholy music evocative music and let us just sit and listen and feel our way through um, my husband's the artist in the family a poet and a musician and i i also considered commissioning him to do uh something but then i thought nope i i may not be able to uh write you a poem or sing you a song on this but what i what i am my intention what i am venturing to do today is is simply to pay tribute to sadness and melancholy um, and, and, and take a bit of a pause where we can really put it front and center where I think in some ways it deserves to be. Um, I was introduced to a Jungian psychotherapist and writer named Francis Weller by a colleague of mine. And he wrote a book called The Wild Edge of Sorrow. And it's really stuck with me that title, The Wild Edge of Sorrow. Uh, you'll see the picture that I chose here um, may not be an uh, image that would typically be conjured by the word melancholy. Um, I'm hoping by the end of this presentation that you'll have a sense of why I chose it, but in it, I'm, I, part of what I was hoping to capture was this wild, wild edge. Um, a little bit about me just to start, I, I should mention I, I'm by no means a grief expert, nor am I a therapist. Um, I'm also one of the only speakers at this conference who is not a parent. I am someone whose whole life has been preoccupied by a desire to understand humanness and the human condition. Uh, this quest took me from sociology to conflict analysis and resolution uh, to finding my way to Dr. Neufeld's attachment-based developmental approach. I've been his student for uh, almost 20 years now, and of all of the insight I've gained, which uh, has been incredibly vast, by far the most profound um, for me have been the lessons around the importance of feeling sadness. Uh, what I'm hoping to share with you today is a, just a, a glimpse into the story of my own uh, personal revolution around this topic. Um, and it's such an individual, vulnerable, personal topic. Um, it's not easy to talk about in this format. Um, what I'm planning on doing is borrowing a few of Dr. Neufeld's slides and infusing them with some of my own experience and stories. And in doing so, I, I hope to uh, do honor to this emotion um, and, and maybe bring it a bit more into your consciousness. Um, I'm going to start at the beginning, well, <laughs> at least my beginning. As I said, this is a story of a personal revolution. Uh, so you'll need to know a little bit about where I came from to uh, understand what I mean by that. Um, my mother had a quote, and this sort of encapsulates her in so many ways. Um, and I'll put this quote up here to start. The world is so full of such marvelous things, I'm sure we should all be as happy as kings. So a couple of asides here. One, um, I, as I got older, I, I quickly was suspect about uh, whether kings are actually happy or not, but we'll leave that aside for the second. You may somewhat recognize this quote. It's a Robert, well, 
Robert Louis Stevenson from Ch Children's Garden of Verses. However, uh, much to my surprise, uh, as I looked it up um, years after I had first heard her say it, uh, she actually changed the words ever so slightly. The uh, actual poem says the world is so full of a number of things. I'm sure we should all be as happy as kings. Well, uh, if that isn't my mother in a nutshell, that she added, she couldn't handle just the world is full of a number of things. They had to be marvelous things. And for the most part, I certainly felt that way. Um, I felt very um, fortunate and, and I felt uh, very excited about what the world had in store. Um, but there was also a dawning realization from quite a young age that there was a bit more to this story that there were certainly marvelous things in the world, tremendous beauty and joy. But there were other things too. Horror, devastation, pain, anguish, loss, suffering. The simple fact that my father was an environmental scientist trying to um, restore degraded land meant that we had degraded nature. Uh, I, as I started studying in school, I was fascinated by war, conflict. How do we treat each other this way? How is it possible? I could feel how attachment, love made my world go round. Um, and I could feel uh, so many of the, um, so much of the potential in the world, but I also had a sense that there was a looming threat, that if you loved or cared about something or someone, there was the possibility of losing them or it. And suddenly I began to see around me all sorts of what uh, we here uh, would understand after seeing Dr. Neufeld's keynote um, as separation. Even in young childhood, there are so many experiences that can challenge us. Uh, for children, there is so much happening in their world that they can't control be it bedtime, and we know that can be all sorts of challenges, be it um, parents having to work, daycare, going to school, the birth of another sibling uh, that maybe you would want to send back from where they came, um, discipline, uh, to some of today's discipline strategies that are really focused on uh, separation, um, and then the, the, the really the, the big ones, like uh, the biggest of all, death. In my case, life kept many of these big losses at a distance for me in the early years, unlike so many others experiences, but that didn't mean I didn't sense it around me, I could feel it looming and I could see that it came in many shapes and sizes. There was all sorts of encounters with separation and they could hurt being rejected feeling like you neglected by or not important to, unloved by, not mattering, not belonging, loneliness, feeling betrayed, feeling discounted by, not being able to hold on when apart, not being understood by, not being liked by. Oh, these can hurt us. I remember watching um, the other children at school. I remember I could hardly bear as I watched feelings get uh, tripped up all over the place and watching children, uh, the kids around me um, uh, uh, facing some of this and, 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 and sensing some of these myself. We, it, it was interesting to me because at, at first, um, when I started recognizing some of these feelings, um, both in myself or in others, I used to, I, I, I believed that my aim should be uh, to work like crazy so that nobody feels like this. Prevent these feelings, make them go away. Can't we love each other? Can't we build a perfect world where nobody feels any of these things? Avoid, avoid, avoid. Um, uh, I, I really thought that there, you know, uh, Interestingly enough, if you fast forward a little bit, and, and my master's degree is in international conflict resolution, I really was hoping to work towards a world uh, where there was peace, where there was no conflict, where there was no hurt, no wounds. But what do we all know to be true? 
separation is inevitable. It's everywhere, and it comes in all shapes and forms, from little frivolous losses and wounds to di gigantic, gaping, raw holes. You think about, and you'll permit me for uh, looking a little more directly at the sun here, um, since we are in a session focused on sadness, but the, the fact, the simple fact that everybody dies how are we meant to bear that separation is inevitable this did not fit into the map that i got from my mother which begged the question if separation is inevitable are we doomed to nothing but endless suffering what a cruel twist of fate how can this be possible what kind of design is this that separation is inevitable Cruelty and suffering exist, and no matter how much we love someone, they will inevitably die. Are we doomed to nothing but endless suffering? It turned out that there is a surprise answer to this question, or at least a surprise to me. It was Dr. Neufeld who first illuminated this for me, and uh, not a surprise to me that it took a developmentalist to teach me this. Um, and the answer that he shared came in two parts. I put the key in the middle here, um, as it really did unlock something in me. Um, there is an answer to separation, even in its most extreme doses. And that answer is adaptation. Adaptation is the key to human possibility and potential, the key to recovery, the essence of healing, human beings are infused with an incredible ability to adapt to anything the potential for adaptation exists in all of us and is always there but this was only the first part of the lesson there was a part two and the second part of the lesson is that the very foundation of civilized society is predicated on us having our tears. I write that down as a quote of Dr. Neufeld's and one that stopped me in my tracks. Tears? What? And here is me who has been seeking for the foundation of civilized society, yearning for, for a civilized society. But tears? Tears as the answer to that? I thought we were trying to dry away each other's tears. I thought we were trying to prevent tears. Um, I spent so much time trying to dry them away. I assume, and I think it's so often the case, we assume they are a sign of something wrong, something that we must um, put, put, a, put a stop to, that we must uh, prevent or distract from. But no, tears front and center. It turns out that central to adaptation is for us to have our tears. As I said, for so many years, I was trying to understand what can go wrong. What goes wrong uh, in this marvelous world with so many marvelous things? What makes us so uncivilized with each other? And it slowly revealed itself to me that underneath virtually all forms of the most odious and troubling behavior is unshed tears. The most compelling argument I have heard for what can go wrong for us as humans is not loss, but instead ungrieved loss. When we're talking about adaptation, we are talking about an emotional process. This is the emotional process by which we become changed by feeling our way through what we cannot change. It is not rational. It is not cognitive. It is an emotional process. It's not a choice nor a skill to be learned or taught. It's not about something we do. Um, and we tend these days to rely so much on our heads, mind over matter, choosing to get over something. This is not a choice. 
it's also much deeper than adjustment or accommodation. And this is important uh, here too. One of my colleagues, Michelle Maurer, has a, a, a whole slide where she teases apart adaptation versus adjustment. And, and, and we do so much adjusting, and especially right now during pandemic times, you know, we are adjusting, adjusting a little bit of the little, you know, uh, little course corrections. Um, uh, or shrug, you know, trying to trying to care less, trying to shrug it off, uh, trying to deal with it. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about a profound, deep, much deeper transformation. Uh, adaptation is driven by the feelings of futility, what we just looked at, evoked when up against something we cannot change or control. And it's not enough to know the futility of an endeavor. For example, to know that we're not able to change someone's mind or to make someone want to be with us or to make a good experience last or even to bridge death, we may very well know that we cannot um, prevent somebody from dying or that we cannot, but the futility must be felt. It's not about it staying up here in our heads. It must come down to the place where we feel the futility for adapt for the adaptive process to occur and this is going to be a theme we keep coming back to and in this case it's what's pivotal is not just feeling any feelings and you'll notice that this is a theme throughout this conference the importance of feeling our emotions um, in this case it is feeling sadness that we're a specific emotion, sadness, that we're particularly interested in. And so a few notes about sadness here. Um, and I borrow these from a presentation Dr. Newfeld gave on sadness, and, 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 and he describes, uh, this is a very brief description of sort of the science behind this, this place of conversion. Uh, sadness is a feeling of futility evoked when futility is registered emotionally like we said, as opposed to cognitively, causing an energy shift in the autonomic nervous system to the parasympathetic system of rest and moving us to tears if intense enough. Now, uh, for the science on this, um, I, I direct you to Eva Degosny's presentation on emotional health in the brain. It's a fascinating field of study, and there is so much to explore out there. Just as we have sidelined sadness uh, so much in uh, current cultures, um, so too in the science. Um, just like love is hard to measure, hard to study, so too is grief, so too is sadness. But um, some really interesting work out there. So I, I, I will leave this. It's a huge area we could explore. Um, but I do recommend um, the presentations on defenses as well as Eva's presentation on the brain. Another note about sadness is to do with language here, with word origins. And this was fascinating to me. The word sadness is derived from the Latin sate, meaning turning point, which interestingly enough, sate is also the root of satiation, quite different than what we would think. So turning point, signifying its pivotal role in the conversion of emotion. Now, it's only in the Middle Ages where the word sad became connected to happy, like it became its antithesis. It didn't start out that way. We now have this description, happy versus sad. That's not where the language came from. And interesting to see how much we've lost as we lose some of these original sort of conceptions of, um, of the language around this. Um, very interesting to, um, to explore where it came from. And also, um, you know, all of these different words that we use, melancholy, grief, sorrow, they conjure different things in us. And we have different understandings of it, which is part of what makes this so hard to talk about. Another note about sadness, and I've referenced this here, but it's undoubtedly the human emotion that has been most discounted, resisted, countered, shamed, misunderstood, misdiagnosed, maligned, feared, and now even pathologized. Sadness is also often confused with depression, despair, or a state of unhappiness, all of which are characteristic by, characterized by emotional stuckness and the lack of feeling in general, as well as the lack of feelings of sadness in particular. Sadness is a very moving experience. 
And this is huge and very important here. Another place that we've come become conceptually confused, where we assume that um, sadness is synonymous with depression, um, which it very much is not. I love how Dr. Neufeld says sadness is a moving experience. And I mentioned Peter Weller at the beginning of this talk, and he, uh, or sorry, Francis Weller. Peter Weller's an actor, Francis Weller, and he um, does grief work. And he spoke about the physicality of real grief and sadness. It's moving. It moves our whole body. It's quite incredible. Um, not at all characterized with that flat um, flatness that we associate with um, depression. And, and there are several presentations in this conference on um, emotional defense. And I encourage you to watch those um, to explore um, some of those constructs more. But for the case of um, this presentation today, I now I'm going to use uh, some of Dr. Neufeld's resilience slides to illustrate this this adaptive process in how it's uh, how nature intended it to work. Remember, we put adaptation front and center as nature's answer to inevitable experiences of separation. And that is that there is an emotional bounce back that is automatic and spontaneous that comes on the other side of an emotional letdown. And I um, You'll see the sine wave here. Uh, all energy moves in waves and emotion is no different. Uh, it moves in a wave-like fashion, like waves of the sea, undulating, oscillating. And I think we should feel that in ourselves. Emotions aren't just all the say, all in, all the time. They come in waves. And for the purposes of illustration here, we're going to blow up just this middle part, uh, just one down and up turn of this, uh, these waves. And as we zoom in here, we're going to take a look at the transformative work of sadness. And you'll see these arrows going down to represent uh, feeling our way to these feelings of futility. Uh, sadness is what transforms what didn't work, what we couldn't change, into something that in turn transforms us. When we surrender to the letdown, we don't feel in control, nor should we. It's not a comfortable place. I, I, it's, it's not, not at all. It can, be, it can be quite a daunting place. We don't feel in control. We can be tossed through and through. It can be uncomfortable and scary. Um, but there's another side to the story. Nature, ha uh, nature converts that energy into a bounce back. It isn't that we will just stay there, even though it can feel that way that, oh, if I go down to this place, I'm going to get stuck there. No, there is a transformation that happens at the at this place at the bottom of this wave. Um, it's not easy to trust the process. But if we do, and if we uh, surrender, it's something that happens to us. We've so often viewed emotion as a problem, like emotion's going to sink us. We've got to get um, keep our emotions at bay. Otherwise, we'll just keep going down, down, down. We have to fight this with our mind. Uh, we so often think that the answer is in right thinking, thinking differently, rather than in our heart. But surprisingly, it's precisely only by going down to these depths that the possibility of a true bounce back occurs. And I'll add in this extra um, version that Dr. Neufeld did, and he put a figure in here, and I appreciated that. It's sort of abstract up until you put the figure in there, and, and this sort of illustrates the tumbling loss of control. And as I said, it's not comfortable, especially when it's not supported, when we don't support this in each other, when it's not supported by our society. Separation is inevitable, but nature has a bounce back plan. But that bounce back necessitates us to go to the depths first, all the way down. I'm, now I'm going to go to a different image and I have a story to tell, try to bring it out of sort of 
out of our heads into our hearts, perhaps, at least for me, it was an illustrative example of this transformation. Um, and so here you have the bounce back um, and, and that point at the bottom circled there, this pivotal turning point where we feel the sadness about what didn't work. Uh, Dr. Neufeld often symbolizes this with the hourglass, and you'll see at the top, so separation is inevitable. Separation, as we know from his keynote, evokes powerful emotions in us, and these emotions, frustration, alarm, are often at the root of anger and rage and, and anxiety problems and all a whole host of um, ways that we can get stuck up there with these separate, fierce, intense separation emotions. Um, but sadness is this place where these feelings of futility convert those separation emotions into a new possibility of a new beginning. These separations must be drained, an end of a chapter before a new uh, beginning. And, and the story that I wanted to tell here is about a, a dear friend of my husband and I is, is a, my husband's drummer, I said he was a musician, and we've known him for many years and, and know intimately the story of he and his brother and their family. And oh my goodness, uh, a long journey of trauma, of loss, of struggle, diagnoses, addictions. Um, the stories would make my heart weep and, and, and bleed for them as, as sometimes uh, they would share them with us. Um, but no tears of sadness from their end of things, just lots of stuckness, I would describe it as. And not that long ago, just before a pandemic, um, it had hit a particularly low place um, where our friend, he was watching his brother go down the same path as their mother. And it was just too much for him. He had grown and he, well, two things. Uh, it went so over the top that he grew cold. We would call him and, and his voice was flat and cold and hard, 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 hard. And then if there was any sort of emotion expressed at all, it was anger and rage. It was vile. Oh, the things that he would say to us about his brother and about life and about himself. And it was either this coldness or this huge amount of rage. And my husband and I were, were so concerned. And on one particularly bad day, um, my husband got a phone call and, and his friend was just raging, raging, raging. And he took a risk and thought, oh, he can't be alone and he can't be at home right now with his brother. This is not going to go well. And so he invited him to come to us and we both sort of said, don't know what to expect here, but he came over and he was in a state. Um, he had had so much frustration and alarm evoked in him and just almost complete shutdown and then out of and then moments of this wild rage and 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 it was quite scary sort of to behold but i i knew enough of the story and 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 he came over and we both managed to sort of keep a bit of space as he was you know all of this foul foul stuff was coming out of his mouth and listen quietly and 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 you know he was pacing around the apartment and and um i wasn't sure what to do to be perfectly honest but my husband somehow at a certain moment and he somehow the timing ended up just right he took a risk and he put his hand on our friend's shoulder and and at the moment you know our our, our friend was was saying just the most horrible things about his brother and 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 about his situation in life. And, and my husband put a hand on his shoulder and said ever so gently, this is not how you wanted your story to go. And right there in front of my eyes, that boiling rage somehow converted to a, a, the shaking, like a physical shaking and then converted to his eyes filling up first time in my life. I mean, I'd known him for almost 20 years, filling up and then exploding with tears, coming faster and faster and louder. And at first, all of the fear tumbled out and then, and then sadness. At first about now, about what he was seeing in his brother, about what he didn't want to see in his brother, and then back 
and back about to what he didn't want to see in his mother and his father to what he wasn't able to do until he was weeping for two innocent little boys all those years ago and the tears they came and they came and they were moving through his whole body i've never experienced anything quite like that you know just pouring out of him it was probably 20 minutes of this and then before my eyes i witnessed again another shift he took his face out of his hands and his eyes looked up and for the first time in months and months and months, maybe years, I saw this little glimmer of hope and this little bit of new softness. That rage, the hatred, all of those words that had been spewing out a moment ago, well, 30 minutes ago at this point, were gone. They were gone. And wouldn't you know it if he didn't look up at us with a few ideas about some way that he could help his brother, something that he could do. But it was that place of, and I thought, you know, all of the different ways my husband and I could have, oh, you don't really feel like that about your brother or, oh, you know, that's not a nice thing to say. You know, there's so many different ways that we could have interfered with that. We could have tried to distract him. We could have got, you know, there's so many different things we could have done. But in that moment, for whatever reason, my husband was able to help hold him in that place where he could feel the futility, feel what wasn't working and again so interesting to me when we see the people we love um, before they've gotten to that place we so often want to add in all these thoughts well wait but what about the other hand and the most fascinating thing to me was without saying a word after those tears were shed it was he who was coming to us with the other hand incredible he was saying back to me all of the things that I would have wanted to helpfully add in, but they were coming from him on the other side of feeling what didn't work. And there's a name for this place. I, interestingly enough, this, this lowest point, um, this place of sadness, uh, the depths of it, and it's called the Nadir. Uh, when Dr. Newfield and I were looking at this, we looked up the definition, and um, the sort of standard definition now is the lowest point in fortunes of a person or an organization. Um, uh, for example, they had the example they give in the dictionary, they had reached the nadir of their suffering. Interesting. Um, but it uh, has a, a origins in astronomy. It's actually the point on the celestial sphere directly below the observer. So when you think of the celestial sphere, you can see all around you. It's the point directly underneath you, the one place you cannot see. It's a precious place not an easy place to look at like we said you know staring at the sun you can only but it is um such an important place and 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 our friend mentioned to me later um after the fact that he was very afraid of this place he thought it was much safer to stay in not caring and i thought that was really interesting i thought about how much we tend to court that in our society, that we think the answer is somehow about caring less about something. I see this all the time in the pandemic with all of the adjustments that we've had to do. Um, so much has been taken away from us. So much is out of our control. There is so much we are, so many walls we are coming up against. And yet this pressure to have certain things matter less to keep to 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 um to care less um becomes so, is, is so ubiquitous in our society and such a wrong turn uh in my opinion uh, i'm just going to quickly uh go over this this particular slide because um this is again from dr Nifold's presentation on uh, the eclipse of sadness and 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 he just sort of puts in a nutshell sadness has singular work meaning uh only sadness is truly able to deliver uh, these things to us. Um, sadness delivers relief from the pressure of stuck emotion. Sadness provides emotional reset and renewal. Sadness 
can provide emotional rest from futile work, enabling healing and letting go. Sadness, the worry of sadness is to help with prime recovery of the capacity for fulfillment. So here it is. This is what is so fascinating to me. In a world full of suffering and tragedy, sadness becomes the paradoxical entrance into happiness. Happiness actually is found on the other side of tears that have not yet been shed. There's a quote of an anonymous child, a quote, sadness is like laughter, only wetter. I love that. Oh, if we could encourage our children to have tears the way we encourage them to have laughter. We don't try to stop. Well, I mean, we try to stop if you're laughing at someone, but we would never try to curtail a giggle fit unless, you know, there was noise. Okay, maybe we would for other reasons, but our hearts wouldn't want to stop laughter. Why do we so quickly want to jump all over tears? Um, it develops resilience as strength results from facing and feeling futility. So it's so interesting, uh, our friend who had that experience and he reflected on it with me after the uh, he, he thought he was being stronger by not feeling and the courage and strength he felt after feeling his way through after grieving some of what hasn't worked in his life was quite remarkable and restores hope and perspective. And this is, again, that paradoxical place that it is from going down to the depths of sorrow that actually unlocks a key to joy and hope. And sometimes with the youngest children, we can actually see this conversion happening almost at the same time. Uh, Dr. Nufa found this great beautiful image of this child and you see the tear coming down the cheek at the same time you know it's still falling but this lightning is already happening on the other side of tears is not just a lightning but also a softening a softer heart for us as adults, especially as we get older, uh, in my experience, when we hit that place and our tears finally come, so, so many of us have stuck unshed tears. When we hit that place and our tears finally come, the softness and the civilizing on the other side of that is just remarkable. I, at the beginning of the pandemic, my husband went through a horrible bout with health problems, and it was just debilitating for him. And at the end of the, you know, right before he was coming into some recovery, um, it necessitated uh, a lot of muscle work. And so I was having to do some deep tissue muscle work on his legs. And um, suddenly we realized, you know, and he'd been so frustrated, so much pain, so much. And, uh, and as I was doing some of that muscle work with him, um, and it, it's tight muscles, he, suddenly he realized he was noticing some tears coming. And um, for many of us here who perhaps do um, some sort of uh, dance or yoga or physical activity, I know that can happen for me, the right stretch in the right moment and spontaneously some tears will come. Often uh, people have stories of going to have a massage and the tears coming. Well, um, my husband said it was just remarkable for him as, as he didn't know where they came, they totally surprised him. But, but the softness I saw in him on the other side, the softness that came out was just remarkable. Grief can soften the hardest parts of us. If we turn towards sorrow, we will soften. Grief is heavy, but is not simply meant to be endured. It contains medicine and transformation. And soft hearts coincidentally, are key to our humanity. They're key to our humanness. We need our soft hearts. Uh, that is how nature uh, intended to get the best out of us. Um, the the um, uh, fulfillment of human potential is predicated on our soft hearts, on being able to feel our soft feelings. So therefore, does that not make a case for sadness? Oh, well, 
I'm hoping that it made a case for sadness. Sounds pretty good to me, but it's not common knowledge. It's not something that we are uh, granting the uh, attention it deserves. So why? What gets in the way? Now, just a, a few notes here. Um, I don't want to spend too long on this. There's a whole uh, host of things we could explore here. But just a, a few notes, the fear of the letdown, and this is huge, and I mentioned this with a friend of mine, uh, that, that fear that if one lets go or gives up, one may never bounce back, the fear of the abyss, like we see that sine wave, like we're going to tumble and just keep tumbling out of the bottom end. Um, or the, that one must not let go of perspective or right thinking. That was huge for me. One mustn't think negatively or despair may set in. One must persevere and not give in to feelings. One may lose control and come undone. One mustn't wallow in self-pity or feel sorry for them, ourselves. These messages are ubiquitous coming uh, from society to each of us. This fear of the letdown is huge. And so instead of um, when, when these feelings arise, instead of Tom allowing us to, 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 be, to be transformed, allowing us to feel our sadness, allowing us to go down and to be carried and tossed around by sorrow, we instead desperately clamber our way back up the front end. And when I first saw this image, oh boy, it was a confrontation to me. Because even though I was already starting to transform into seeing sadness as this important emotion in our lives, I still had to admit, I was quite allergic to it. I was trying to scramble out the other side, especially when I would see it in other people. We, we see emotions as the enemy. We fight emotional letdowns. Um, there is, when we're not informed by nature having this plan for us with our emotion, we think it's all up to us to figure it out. Um, and we, we think that we must get our perspective back. We should be being more positive. We can't stay in that negative place. We're not thinking about all the other hands. We think we should pursue happiness uh, instead of allowing happiness to come on the other side. Um, we search for skills of resilience. We pursue calmness and tranquility. We are in a culture that is chasing 24-hour happiness, just like we chase 24 hour grocery stores, and we have eclipsed seasons. We have eclipsed chapters. We force and we push and we pull instead of honoring nature. We put so much pressure on our heads and our logic to figure it out. We have um, cast aside so many of the rituals and the ceremony that culture had put in place to protect um, times of sadness um, and, and, and make room for it. Um, and, and like I said, we've discounted this idea of chapters, of endings before beginnings. That's, uh, the seasons are so powerful to me. We need winter before spring. And in winter, this barren time, when it could be so inconceivable to have hope. We know the promise of spring exists. The blueprint is right there in nature. And we have lost our way with this, I feel. We also, as I said, spend so much time um, helping others with this, trying to pull our children, our loved ones out of this place. Oh, you see the tears coming. Oh, giving the other hands, like I said, trying to restore perspective, trying to pull them back out the front end instead of honoring that nature has a plan, that there is a way that by actually feeling what they're starting to feel, there will be another side to it. It occurs to me that it takes strength, courage, support, room, and patience to truly feel our sadness. Even in friendships and families, I think so often the message, don't cry, it's not so bad, let me make it better, or let me help distract you, is so tempting. 
it, it occurred to me um, as I was thinking about um, how many of the people that I know in my life see, see therapists or counselors, and also many of uh, the people I know and love are therapists and counselors, but it, it occurred to me um, that there may be a particular reason they seem so necessary in our world these days. And is that because our culture no longer supports or makes room for sadness? Because when I just think about, um, when I think about uh, therapists and, and, and counselors, I think they are, are protectors and collectors of tears. And it might be the only place, the, the, the counselor's office might be the only place left where, uh, especially adults, but where individuals can go and freely cry in the company and safety of another human. Why aren't we able to do this for each other more? How we've missed, we've missed an incredible possibility here, a new way to support each other. One of my colleagues introduced me to this beautiful quote by Althea Salter, an American developmental psychologist. And she said, when children cry, the hurt has already happened. Crying is not the hurt, but the process of being unhurt. I love that quote. Now, one more note about what gets in the way, and this is a huge one, and I'm borrowing this from another colleague of mine, Joanna, and she wrote a beautiful piece on how shy sadness is. And I loved that she chose that word for it. Sadness is shy. Emotions can be uh, quite messy and big and in our face and, 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 and they can take over and jump to the fore. Sadness doesn't jump to the front and grab our attention like so many of the other, the, the, the fierce separation emotions I talked about, like frustration and pursuit and alarm. Frustration, pursuit, they jump to the front so quickly. They are much less vulnerable. Um, it is so. Um, so and, and, and those emotions can be so loud within us that that sadness gets buried underneath. Um, and it's so easy to lose the shape of what is missing, what we are missing. It's such vulnerable territory. Our defenses get triggered. We no longer feel the specific holes. We distract ourselves because sadness is a vulnerable. It is shy and it is vulnerable. It's not easy to face. It takes a certain amount of room and space. It's like you have to hold some other things at bay to invite sadness to the table because it's kind of quiet. It's quieter than some of the other emotions, or at least the uh, it doesn't it 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 doesn't knock at your door quite so loudly as frustration does, for example. And on top of it being shy and vulnerable, add that to the fact that in our world, distractions are increasing by the second. And what do we have? A perfect storm. We have this shy emotion that's so important for us to make room for and feel, yet distraction is everywhere. And because it's vulnerable territory and because defenses come into play, we are so tempted to distract, distract, distract ourselves and so tempted to distract others. We see tears. We see our children cry. We don't want to see suffering. We have assumed that tears mean suffering and that there's something to be nipped in the bud. So we try to distract distract, distract. And uh, I would be remiss to not mention the smartphone in this, because to me, I've come to believe that uh, it may be the enemy of sadness. With it around, these shy feelings almost don't stand a chance. It's there, always ready to grab your attention, always ready when, you know, if you had a moment to really sit and reflect and perhaps feel the shape of missing. But you've got, it's dinging at you, you've got messages, you've got all sorts of ways to, um, all sorts of ways to distract yourself from feeling, uh, uh, from going to some of these uncomfortable places. So what do we do if sadness is shy and distraction is everywhere? What could possibly help us with this very delicate 
powerful, essential process. But there is an exciting answer here too. And that is play to the rescue. Tamara's keynote and other sessions uh, will focus on emotional playgrounds and a more thorough review of true play. But in this case, uh, what I'm interested in is play's incredibly powerful ability to assist us with our feelings, specifically sadness. And so uh, play turns out that it can move us to tears in very unique ways. Uh, play is probably the first place where we should touch futility, to get used to feelings of disappointment and sadness, to deal with pretend loss, with the losses and losing that don't really count. And you see Dr. Neufel put this bubble around uh, futility and flew that play figure in here. Play can move us to tears by rendering defenses unnecessary and making it easier to feel. By giving something to cry about that is one step removed and thus not too much to bear. I often find, and, and I'll get to some stories of this, that I can find my own tears through venturing in sort of sideways um, uh, through uh, stories and music and films, giving something else to cry about that then taps in and helps move something in us. Play can shift the locus. We talked about how important this is from the head to the heart. We're so stuck in our heads and we want to go from thinking to feeling here and play is one of the best deliverers of that. By playing directly into our emotions, as in melancholy music, poetry, or a sad story, this is huge. I could have done this whole presentation probably only on this one point, and I am going to expand it uh, uh, for the most of the remainder of this session. By removing the self-consciousness, shame, fear, and social sanctions around tears, again, we tolerate tears in play much more than we do for real. And by providing safe release for stuck emotions, thus making it easier to fall into our tears in the wake of intense expression. It is amazing. After a real intensive play session, oh, we can fall into our tears sometimes. I'm going to elaborate on a few of the... Um, a few kinds of play here, I highlight a few of the arts. As I said at the beginning, this topic and this territory, the feelings of sadness, um, it really is, I think, uh, mainly our artists who have led the way uh, for us. And, and there's a few of the arts that go hand in hand with sadness in many different forms. And, and speaking of play, the play, uh, must start here and it's just fascinating to look back the history of theater and you go back to the ancient Greeks and the idea of tragedy and comedy. Plays were central. The entire village would come out for the play. Everyone from ruler to slave everyone was invited it mattered not who you were somehow there was this understanding that everyone must be invited to the play and there was two themes of the plays in ancient Greece the comedy and I like to think about I heard Dr. Neufeld say once we need to laugh at our leaders so we don't kill our leaders. <laughs> I thought that was a, uh, he was being slightly tongue in cheek, but I think there's truth to the matter here. And I know for many of us how much uh, relief we get from being able to poke fun at or laugh about those. And you look at Saturday Night Live to me is sort of an offshoot of coming from this place of coming together to uh, poke fun at those in charge. Uh, this is an art form that has carried over uh, through time that we have certainly been able to keep intact. You think about all of the, you know, here in Canada, we have uh, political spoofs that we do. And so we've kept that piece intact. But what was the other form of play back in for the ancient Greeks or for Shakespeare? It wasn't just the comedy. 
it was also the tragedy. There was some sort of unconscious understanding that the entire town, the entire village needed to come together and find their tears. The ancient Greeks understood the power of play so much better than us. Everyone was invited. Invited to come and join in an experience of loss, an experience of loss one step removed. And I think about the times of the ancient Greeks and loss must have been in everyone's faces. I mean, death happened right in front of you in a way that does not happen the same way for us in this world today. So much loss, so much to adapt to. And here they had these tragedies, these times to come together and find their tears one step removed. And there have been some incredible projects recently that have come out of an understanding of this. I have a few colleagues who have been involved in um, projects in prisons, um, especially with young offenders, juvenile delinquents. They've done it in all sorts of uh, prisons with some of the hardest hardened criminals. Um, where they have brought in plays and particularly plays with tragic themes. And time and time again, you will find the toughest care, the toughest individuals finding a corner of their unshed tears through being able to take on this role one step removed. Oh, theater can be so powerful for this. Um, I think about myself as a child, and I, I mentioned my mother and her focus on happiness, but as I said, being an artist and introducing me to art and theater and music, this was the one place where these themes were allowed. Les Miserables was my favorite musical, and that is entirely about loss, about suffering and grief and the themes, the sadness woven through Les Miserables. Why is that um, one of the most popular of all of the musicals in the world? Because we know we must feel these feelings somewhere. And so coincidentally, this was permitted. This was the one place where I could rub up against some, where I could touch some of that. So that's that the play, um, theater. Now, writing and poetry is huge. In fact, it is only in poetry that I, I've really seen uh, throughout history uh, individuals trying to uh, uh, put word, trying to capture and honor sadness, but also the expressive form of writing, of putting pen to paper and letting some emotion move in us. So it's not just rattling around in our head, but coming out, um, journaling, journaling some of our melancholy thoughts and, 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 and giving permission to journal some of that, you know, for me, again, I, I got stuck in my journaling in my early years, because I thought, oh, I, I, I shouldn't write all this depressing stuff. I need to, I, I, I should be happy. I should be um, uh, grateful. I need to be writing about those things. No permission to write it all the other side down. And then movement and dance, of course, there are incredible expressive dance programs. Uh, Hannah Beach, who's also presenting at this conference, um, has an incredible um, expressive dance program where she works with young people through dance to help let some of this emotion move, bring some of this sadness to a place where it can move through our bodies and be expressed. Um, so many of the arts, um, are key to us finding and feeling, our, to, to inviting sadness out, this shy emotion. Uh, we can invite it through the arts, um, the play, dance, but most of all, at least for me, now here you'll hear my own personal bias come out. We all have our own bents here, but for me, music is by far the most powerful companion to sadness. It somehow bypasses our brain. It's the bubble we need. It carries us. Um, there are so many times when 
I suddenly have tears brought to my eyes when sad thoughts or or the idea of crying is so far from my consciousness and then some song is playing at the grocery store on the radio wherever it may be that it just bypasses all of my defenses it bypasses my brain which isn't you know it's pretty loud in my brain but it somehow bypasses all of that and taps right into my heart and a tear comes I go back to my childhood and as I said in, 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 in the play and theater, dark thing, themes were welcomed and sadness could come out to play, but also in music. There are so, so much of my favorite music had these dark themes and this melancholy. Um, I, I had always um, been drawn to, to Jacques Brel, to musicians who have themes, to, to Leonard Cohen, to, um, uh, and, 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 and my parents as well. And it's interesting to me, again, this one place that we could agree it was okay to touch on um, some of these more vulnerable feelings. Um, I think back to my whole life, ha my sorrow has had a soundtrack. My high school angst, I felt it through song. When I moved away to university and was on my own for the very first time, it is only, it is only in music that I had enough of a bubble to feel some of my feelings. Um, as I began experiencing some of the bigger, deeper futilities in my own life, um, music revealed itself to be e even more powerful than I had first thought. Uh, a, a story for you here. Uh, some years ago, um, I had been with Dr. Neufeld. Uh, he was offering a conference in Montreal. And I, I lived in Montreal with my husband for eight years, and we had a, a uh, adopted family there, which was a, a, a 10 piece band that we were part of, um, a community of misfit musicians, um, a very precious time in my life. And, and I was back in Montreal, lots of feelings evoked, <laughs> lots of emotion evoked, I should say there, but I had work to do. We had a big conference to put on and I was studying the maps and making sure I had knew how to drive this rental car and could get Dr. Newfield there at the right time and make sure that every Everything was set up and everything was going to go as planned and it was stressful and I and I had work to do and I didn't have any room to feel any of my uh, to to feel any of the emotions stirred in me from being back there. And the conference finished and it was my last night in Montreal I was absolutely exhausted and I got invited I was so fortunate to be invited. It was one year after Leonard Cohen had died and they were opening a tribute exhibit to Leonard Cohen. And uh, one of my um, friends had been part of designing this, um, this tribute and invited me to the red carpet opening. Exciting, I was excited to be part of that. Certainly I have loved Leonard Cohen and my whole life and went to this um, tribute and it was incredible, just incredible. I mean, made me think right from the get go, L look at, look at this outpouring, look at what he meant to all of these people. Is it that he helped give us room for sadness and melancholy? I feel he was one of our ambassadors for that. And there was all of these different displays, one room you could go in and play an organ and each note um, was actually Leonard Cohen uh, um, text of Leonard Cohen reading and so you could kind of play out and he would be speaking to you in all of these different poetic texts and rooms full of screens with all of these images of different shows that he had done and old concert footage and uh, instruments he had played and beautiful exhibit and I'm going through it and I I'm sort of experiencing it um, but then I find this this round booth or small room sort of tucked in the back and I find my way in and I walk in and it turns out that it's this beautiful little round room that has been built uh, specially for acoustics. It's all made of wood and there's speakers in this room and Hallelujah is playing, but not with any words, not with any instruments. They actually commissioned a choir to hum Hallelujah just hum. 
And it's playing through the speakers in this beautiful little round wooden acoustically perfect little room. And hanging from the ceiling are five microphones on cords just hanging there. And you are meant, if you so desire, to come into this space and hum along. Well, I walked in there, and again, I'm coming off the heels of five days of conference. I'm exhausted. I have not slept. I am, I am so far away from feeling any feelings. It's not even funny. And I walk in, and I hear that humming, and I pick up the microphone, and I start humming along. I close my eyes, and wouldn't you know it, the vibrations in the room, the sound of all that humming, joining my voice into it. And if I didn't just dissolve into tears and they came and they came and I ended up sitting there on the floor in this little booth, just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing and, and, and felt so grateful in that moment. I didn't know I needed that. Interesting. And I came out of the booth sort of blurry eyed and it's a little dark and I sort of stumbled over to the side to regroup. And then I realized as I was standing there that there were other people coming out of this same room looking kind of similar to how I felt. And I ended up kind of positioning myself there for the rest of the evening because I was so fascinated listening to the conversations. And here were all of the who's who of Montreal, all of these well put together adults in Montreal out giving a tribute to Leonard Cohen. And they would walk in unsuspectingly into this little room and they'd be in there for a little bit. And then they would come out, tears streaming down their faces and one, after another, after another, looking over at the person beside them saying, I didn't know I needed that. Wow, where did those tears come from? Whew. Oh, that felt good. I really needed to cry. I didn't know I had those tears in me over and over and I was blown away. Could we have a Leonard Cohen booth on every corner where we can just pop in and hum hallelujah for a moment? Could we not? Another story that I want to share with you, this is not mine whatsoever. This comes from a documentary, an incredible documentary called The Story of the Weeping Camel. The most fascinating part of the story is that it shows it's not... Uh, just nature's plan for us alone as humans. And I'll read you this. Uh, Dr. Neufeld paraphrased it uh, sort of from this documentary, A Story of the Weak and Camel from 2003. I think you can find it on YouTube, actually. There's a few places I highly recommend uh, you search for it. Um, a young film student in Berlin remembers touching story from his childhood in Mongolia about a camel who first rejects and then in a special ceremony involving music begins to weep and accept her calf. Hoping to document a reoccurrence of this phenomena, he moves in with a nomadic family and stays throughout the calving season. It isn't until the very last calf is born to a new mother after an incredibly difficult and prolonged labor that the opportunity he was waiting for presented itself. The offspring is a rare white color, and whether it is the color of the calf or the difficult labor that exhausted her, the mother rejects the newborn calf devastating the family whose livelihood depends upon these camels. And Dr. Niffel added a note here, defensive detachment, which is what you're seeing this mother experience, is a reversal of attachment instincts. And you'll hear this in other presentations too. When something is too much to bear, common to many species of mammals, including humans. After the usual type of ceremony is tried but fails, an indigenous musician with a traditional two-string lyre is called upon. He teams up with a young mother of a nomadic family and together they create the music that makes the camel weep, tears visibly streaming from her eyes. And then, and these are images, stills from the movie, and you see that eye and I didn't know camels could weep. You see that tear coming from the eye and sure enough, bright, after those tears come, she accepts her calf and her calf proceeds to come and drink from her. And you see the look 
in the villagers. And I know for me watching this experience, it is powerful, powerful. So what can we do if we need to feel our sadness and we need to find our tears and we uh, uh, want to make, um, make room for this for those around us, what can we do? Play, play, play to the rescue, especially these emotional playgrounds like music and theater and writing and dancing. Um, we can build and foster supportive culture, ceremony, ritual, and there's some sessions in this conference that are focused specifically on that. We can protect and honor tears, honoring tears. How we talk about them matters. And we can lead our children by example. And when I say that, I, I, I must, it's very important to me to put a caveat in here. We want to make it safe for our children to feel their sadness. And, and we want to hold their hand as they walk through it. We want to lead them by example by allowing them to see our sadness too. But especially for our sensitive children, we don't want to lead them too directly. It is sometimes only the little clouds and the little sadnesses that can be touched. And sometimes the word sad is too much. And so we have to find a, you know, we have to be a little careful around our sensitive children to, to protect that space and honor that space without it going over the top and without courting defenses. To close today, where I want to finish is, is some quotes, uh, because I wish I could say, um, what is in my heart more eloquently, but there are a few people who I think have done a phenomenal job. And, and um, first I'll start with Maurice Sendak. Um, and I've always loved uh, Maurice Sendak's work. He is uh, the author of Where the Wild Things Are. But Dr. Neufeld uncovered uh, this quote from him and described it as a picture of adaptation personified at age 83. And this quote is uh, from an interview that he gave near the end of his life. And he says, I'm not unhappy. I cry a lot because I miss people. They die and I can't stop them. They leave me and I love them more. There are so many beautiful things in the world which I will have to leave when I die, but I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. And it's just incredible to me here. Look at how he confronts us. I'm not unhappy, I cry a lot. Wouldn't that be confusing to some? I miss people. They die and I can't stop them. Ha, looking at the sun here, feeling the shape of his holes, of his missing. They leave me and I love them more. There are so many beautiful things in the world which I will have to leave when I die. But I am ready. I am ready. When I first read this quote, I thought, if I could aspire to anything, it would be to walk in Maurice Sendak's footsteps. And now to the poets, they do such a phenomenal job. Um, the person who taught me um, probably the most about my journey with grieving is uh, dear, my dearest colleague, Gail Carney, uh, who died six years ago now. Um, but I got to walk a lot of um, life's journey, a lot of the uh, end of life journey with her. And um, one of the biggest gifts she gave me was an ability to really talk, really talk about it, the ugliness and the messiness and, 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 and not have to um, uh, sugarcoat it or, you know, uh, not have to pretty it up, um, to really walk through it together. And, and she had uh, this poem written, uh, painted on her door, and we would read it together often. And it's William Blake, uh, and just a little part of the quote, it is right, it should be so, man was made for joy and woe. And when this we rightly know, through the world we safely go. Joy and woe were woven fine, a clothing for the soul divine. Under every grief and pine runs a joy with silken twine. There is medicine in loss. Without woe, we will not know joy. And now, 
Elizabeth Barrett Browning. This is from her poem called Tears. Uh, at a point in the poem, she writes, thank God for grace, whoever weep, albeit as some have done, ye grope tear blinded in a desert place and touch but tombs. Look up, those tears will run soon in long rivers down the lifted face and leave the vision clear for stars and sun. Again, that conversion place, tears are not the enemy, they clear our eyes. And this is Hafiz, a Persian poet. Something missing in my heart tonight has made my eyes soft, my voice so tender, my need for God so absolutely clear. This brings me back full circle to my mother, who I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, who uh, taught me everything I know about beauty and appreciation and wonder and who, um, who so desperately uh, yearned to give me a happy life. Um, and uh, recently, as time changes and we grow older, um, she has begun to forget things, um, walking the same path as her own mother who had dementia. And that, of course, um, presents all sorts of challenges in my world. Um, my mother, who doesn't want me to be sad, uh, is no longer the person I remember. She's no longer the keeper of all of my stories. She is no longer the one with all of the answers I'm finding I'm needing to fill in the blanks for her. And as I um, was first noticing these signs, my father and I were talking to each other quite concerned, and both of us were finding um, ourselves more mad than anything else, extremely frustrated and reactive and lost. It's scary when you watch someone not quite holding on to things the way they used to. And watching my father and his stuck emotions, his happy nickname isn't serving him so much right now, frustrated. And I would want to correct her and remind her. And of course you remember, mom, come on, you know this, you know this story, this is our story. So much frustration. And, and I was trying to, you know, go at it from my head as I still so often do, even though I know better and help my dad and help my mom and figure it out and find the answers. And, 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 and I was, I, I could feel my own stuckness with this. It was just sort of spinning my wheels, so much frustration, not going anywhere, and just, just, um, just trapped in a loop with this feeling totally lost. But shy sadness did come and find me. One night, quite desperate, I was on a walk, needing to move, feeling stirred up and frustrated. I was trying to make some space, you know, sometimes I go for walks to do that, trying to make some space to not be distracted by the phone or the television or the computer or whatever it was. And I happened to have um, my music playing and I, I often listen to it on shuffle. I like the experience of being surprised by a song. And this time the universe interceded and a song came on by an artist called David Gray. And the song is sort of my, my melancholy favorite instruments, strings and piano. And all of a sudden, the first word of the song comes on, forgetting. Oh, that caught me forgetting. That's a dirty word for me right now. And I almost turned it off. Even me, who knows all of this, I almost turned it off. I said, oh, ah, no, I don't want to hear about forgetting. And then I said, no, it came on first it came on I should I'm gonna I'm gonna keep walking I'm not gonna turn this off right now and wouldn't you know the song has almost no lyrics just the word forgetting over and over and as I was hearing this word over and over and over the tears Oh, they came, and then they came, and then they came, so much so that I was sure I couldn't bear it. But as is the incredible way with sorrow, I shed those tears, and the song ended, and the best part about songs is they end. They have a beginning and an end, and so they're a great way to let the tears come unlocked, uh, you know, and, 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 and it won't be forever. And the song ended. 
and I felt something had shifted in me. I had my answer. I had to miss what I was losing in my mother so that I could meet her with the softness that I needed where she is now. My mother who taught me how to seek beauty, enjoy, how to appreciate, how to celebrate, but she didn't teach me how to lose. And now I'm losing her. How do I walk this with her? It is only through being able to scratch at the corner of that sorrow and that grief that I can meet her in moments of profound joy that we still have to have together. And so I'm so grateful for that song. And now I have it and it's in my pocket. And every so often when I know I really need it, I'll get in the car or I'll go for a walk and I'll put it on. And sure enough, wouldn't you know it, it starts. And if I'm in the right space, oh, the tears, sometimes they'll come when I just think about the song and it helps carry me. And so that brings me to the last quote of this presentation. And that is from Marcel Pretzel. Grief is praise because it's the natural way love honors what it misses. If we could share any message with those that we love, with the children in our care, to grieve is to praise. It is what nature meant us to do with the holes in our lives. So with that, I come back to my starting image. It's by diving into the tumultuous waters of grief that we become truly human and conversely allow for the possibility of new dawns, new beginning, new light. It is on the other side of tears that true softness and true hope lies. Thank you for indulging me in this ode to melancholy. I wish each of you a bit of room and space and music in your life to feel the shape of some of your missing. Take good care and thank you.